Good morning. It is uh, 10 a.m., so we'll get started. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, December Bridge uh, meeting, and it is our bi-monthly records and information discussion group. We have a full agenda for you today. My name is Gordon Everett. I'm the Director of Customer Relationship Management for the Federal Record Center Program. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a full agenda today. Uh, we will have uh, Scott Rowley, who will be uh, virtual from Seattle. Uh, the continuum resolution was a problem for him to uh, get to travel and get out here. So Scott will be on the phone with us uh, and talk about the uh, National, Transportation, National Transfer and Dis Disposition Program, uh, the new program for the Federal Records Center program. Gary Rauch, Rauchfuss will uh, update you on the records management training program. We'll have Mark Riddle. I think Mark will be the fourth presenter, and he'll talk about controlled, unclassified information. And Don Rosen uh, will talk about the uh, physical 2017 reporting templates and requirements uh, for this year. We'll have folks uh, virtually on YouTube, so we'll be able to uh, have you chat with us, ask questions with us, or email them to rm.communications at nara.gov, and we have someone in the room who will uh, bring those questions forward. So without further ado, let me mention this also. Um, at 1 o'clock, 1 to 3 o'clock, will be the uh, appraisal team 1 meeting for those agencies who are a part of appraisal team 1. Those meetings will take place upstairs from 1 to 3 in the Washington room. So without further ado, do we have uh, Scott Rowley on the phone? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Scott, how about uh, I'll control your slides for you so you uh, right. let me know uh, when you're ready to change slides. All right. Thanks, Gordon. Um, and I will not look at the YouTube, which is lagging a couple minutes behind. So we should be on topics right now. All right. Um, so thank you, everyone. Yes, it seems like I normally make an annual visit uh, to bridge, and it seems like something always comes up, usually the snow, but that's not till the weekend for you guys. But this time it was the continuing resolution and getting travel approved on Monday and getting out on Monday and being able to present on Tuesday uh, seemed problematic. So um, I'm, I'm saddened I can't be there with you each. each uh, as, as we've worked together over the last three or four years, I get to know more and more records officers. We do uh, more and more great projects together. So Bridge has come kind of a highlight of me for the year. Sad, sad news, huh? Um, but uh, anyway, um, it would have been nice to see you all, but thanks for having me here. So we've got uh, four topics today. And, and again, I'm Scott Rowley. Uh, my main area is, is spelled out right in the name, transfer and disposition of records into the record centers. Um, 
I came on about four years ago, and we concentrated a lot on disposition, and we made a lot of changes, um, and we're kind of reaching the culminating point in all of that. So I'm going to review uh, what we've accomplished in the last year in disposal and, and, where, and where we're going. Um, not to denigrate transfers, transfer and disposition, um, and certainly one of the things we're going to find out is if you do more disposal, you have more space, you can bring in more transfers. So transfers are starting to, to uh, uh, pick up for us as well. But most of what we'll talk about today is, is disposition. Um, as I said, uh, you destroy a lot of records, you create some space, so we'll be able to give you an update um, on where we are with uh, space in the FRC. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about, as I said, sort of the culminating um, uh, steps in our, in our disposal practices. Uh, John McAvoy uh, presented to you all at the last bridge meeting and talked about uh, our communications module and disposal module project, CMDM, um, which is going to allow people to approve disposal uh, within the ARCUS portal. And so that's led to a lot of process changes for us for all disposal, whether you're going to do that process in the portal or not. And I'm going to describe that. And then hopefully get you a little more excited about this new uh, disposal in the portal, our disposal module in Arcus. So um, next slide, please, Gordon. So disposal, disposal, disposal. Um, as I said, we've uh, accomplished a lot over the last four years in kind of the, the disposal piece of our Arcus um, electronic backbone where we manage all your holdings um, was fairly bare. Um, and so we spent a lot of time um, building that up to create the kinds of edits that make a, a database powerful. Um, we've essentially loaded in all the disposition authorities um, that are in use uh, within the Federal Record Centers program. Um, and uh, then indicated whether they're temporary or permanent, what the disposition is, uh, and the retention periods. And so once that was in place, it gave us a lot of power um, to, to ensure that uh, records don't have um, underlying potential errors uh, that, that might cause an erroneous disposal. Um, we could do a kind, kind of system edits on that. So um, it's been a great process. We're coming to the end of it. Um, but at the main time, at the same time, we've been doing a lot of just darn physical labor uh, involving disposal. And a shout out should go to all the federal record centers um, who, who, over the last year and a half, um, two years, have, have really stepped up their game uh, in terms of in terms of disposal. Um, <clears throat> so for the first time, starting last year, for the first time, last fiscal year, um, fiscal year 2015, rather. Um, for the first time, we had uh, more disposal, more outgoing records than incoming records. But it was close. It was 1.2 million to 1.1 million. Um, but this year, we blew it out of the water. We, we, we um, destroyed a lot more than, than we brought in. And, and the main reason is the tobacco industry litigation freeze, um, which I'll give you a, a brief update on. But there's also um, lots of other things going on, including other freeze lists and um, agency initiatives to clean up backlogs and, and things like that. Um, so all of this has come together for us in a great in a great way to do this sort of disposal process reengineering I'm about to describe um, and and uh, implement our, our module for all of you who are in Arcus 2.0 who are within the, within the portal. So a couple more bits on on disposal. Next slide, please, Gordon. So FY 2016 transfer and disposal, this, these are basically the key figures. We, we, we brought in 1.1 million. We destroyed 1.5 million. Um, there was actually another 100,000 that's either accessioned into archives, mostly that, that 80,000 uh, under accessions, or, and another 20,000 of permanent withdrawals and compaction projects. So, so it was 1.6 million outgoing, 1.1 million incoming. We gained half a million in space. Each of our record center bays is 250,000 feet. Um, so we recovered, in essence, two bays. Um, and, and at the same time, we took possession in uh, 2016 of two bays out in the Kansas City area. So between those two events, we've got the equivalent of four empty bays 
um, which gives us, as you'll see, a lot more flexibility going forward. Um, the other thing probably to point out here under destruction, um, and we've talked about this problem before previously, uh, when I came on board, we used to do something called the April catch-up cycle to deal with this problem, but we stopped as it was a expensive labor that didn't seem to be a payback, and that is we destroyed 36,000 transfers, but we reviewed 80,000 transfers. So that means over half of them we didn't get a response so far on. Now, some of these responses will come in, but some, some transfers we reviewed in FY15, we didn't get an answer until FY16. Um, and, and, and do the destruction. So, you know, maybe all that washes out. So the key point there is, you know, we're getting maybe 50% of our answers, maybe 60% of our, our, our disposal review requests answered by the agencies. So 40% of the time we were, we're spending on uh, reviewing records that we may or may not get an answer from the agency on. Um, next slide, Gordon. Thanks. And this one should be till disposal through FY 2016. And um, a brief update, uh, I think it was early in, in December 15 that, um, or early in FY 15, in December 2014, um, that Justice Department said we could um, lift till. Um, the July quarter was the first um, quarter that we actually tried to destroy these tobacco industry litigation-related records that now that there was no litigation hold to be destroyed. Um, you can see our original numbers, 190,000 transfers, 2.2 million cubic feet that were immediately eligible. Like many more records, it was almost 20 million records, cubic feet were affected by till, but 2.2 million could be destroyed when it was lifted. So again, going to that math, that's like four uh, record center bays right there. Um, we had a till plan, agencies that wanted to destroy their till records early. We've worked with them. We can still do that, although we're now getting into the uh, third year almost of, of, of working on till. Um, so a lot of agencies have actually zeroed out their till. Um, others are just uh, dealing with it as we, we present it to them. Uh, we did emphasize high-volume transfers, um, both uh, in October of uh, 2015 and now again in October of 2016, um, so that uh, agencies that did sign off on their disposal would get a, um, you know, an early impact on their um, budget in the fiscal year. They would be able to see it early in the year and better manage their budget. So consequently, by emphasizing uh, high volume, and of course that help our space situation as well, um, we're way out in front on the volume of records. We've, we've dealt with 1.6 million cubic feet, and we've destroyed 800,000 we have approvals for another 150,000. This is the end of the FY figures, but they roughly, you know, tick up just a little more here to December. Um, so that's about 70% of of the total volume. So we're at a good, we're ahead of schedule either way you look at it. Um, but especially, uh, you know, on the volume, we we've reaped a lot of what we're going to reap. Although again, the problem is. You know, we've got lots of transfers out there that nobody's responded to yet. And that number's always going to be a little high because we just sent out notices that you're in the process of responding to. So, you know, who knows when all the dust settles, what percentage of till disposal or other disposal um, will be signed. But, again, 60% maybe is at the high end of what we seem to be able to get signed. Um, so if you also do the math in your head, um, we would... Uh, addressed a lot fewer of the transfers, the individual transfers, only 70,000 out of 190,000. So essentially we've got almost 120,000 transfers left to review, um, but only 600,000 cubic feet. Do the math on that, um, and uh, you're talking about 120,000 transfers at an average of five boxes a cubic foot. So you can see that's going to be a lot of review for us and uh, to get the minimal or some payback on the actual destruction. So we benefited from the destruction. We'll continue to benefit as, as notices come in signed, um, but, but mostly we're facing a slog ahead of us uh, just to continue to review transfers and, and get them off to you. Um, I, I said do the math. I, I skipped one of my math problems, 1.5 million um, <clears throat> cubic feet of destruction last year, 1,200 cubic feet of truck. We're talking thousands of trucks 
that the record centers has put on the road, you know, and, and we have 17 record centers, so we're talking, you know, double-digit trucks are on the road every day doing dis- or every week doing destruction for the record centers. Pretty impressive number. Um, not often you get to do something where you actually kind of move the needle in the government, but I really feel like we kind of have. Um, and that all started with the next slide, if you would, Gordon. That's how the agency disposition profile. That was our first effort to try and uh, get agencies to um, uh, pay a little more attention to this issue. Um, we're going to we'll put it out again for FY 2017 near the end of March. It goes to um, all of the records officers, and um, if your agency has a senior agency official, then that senior agency official also receives a copy, and and it spells out, you know. Uh, where you are in terms of your disposal, whether it's accessions, um, till disposal, normal disposal, and, you know, sort of what the backlog is that you could be signing off on, or if you were able to lift litigation holes or other freezes, uh, you could destroy those records. Talks about the dollars associated with those backlogs and then shows, generally speaking, it's $5, a little bit over $5 to destroy or accession a record. Uh, it's two, two and a quarter uh, to store a record for a year. By the third year, you're making your money back. Um, so it tells you um, sort of what the payback is on the effort that's put in there. Lots of agencies are, are enthused about this. I'd like to cl- declare victory and stop issuing it. Um, but they've changed their behaviors, um, and, and they're on top of it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to ever declare victory because I think some agencies now really kind of look forward to it. Um, next slide, Gordon. Space update. So the space update implied by the disposal versus the incoming, you know, we're going to need to watch what happens. The till drops off and maybe some of these other freezes we're lifting drop the off, whether we'll in fact be able to stay ahead of the um, incoming versus outgoing line. Um, there's always a big question records managers want to ask themselves, which is, um, you know, when, when is paper going to die off? When are we going to truly have the paperless office? You know, this may be another effort to fill these record centers back up with the last gasp of paper that agencies have. It's, it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, but we think the paper's out there still. Um, and when the uh, disposal drops off, we think we're going to be in about an even state for a few years, um, but with about as much coming in as going out. Um, so... We gained all those, uh, quote, bays, but a lot of them are interspersed all over the nation, uh, and some of the record centers remain full. You may know we had a robust transshipment policy in the past where we would put often frozen low-end reference records in pallets and in central locations or uh, sometimes on in other record centers. Well, now those freezes are lifting, so the records are coming out of those record centers um, but it's the palletized record centers, it's the records that receive those shipments that are receiving the benefits of those freezes being lifted. The record centers that had space problems half a decade or a decade ago and shipped off their frozen records um, to the Midwest, usually it seemed, uh, they're getting less of a benefit on the till disposal um, or the other freezes that have been lifted. So we still have a few record centers that have very tight space. Um, and our problem is to now sort of even that space out. We have lots of space in the Midwest again, uh, not much space at all on the East Coast, uh, and a few problem smaller record centers around the country as well that are pretty full. Um, so we have different strategies to deal with, with space um, uh, crunches. Um, we've been dealing with a space crunch in the Washington, D.C. area um, for quite some time. Um, and that's going to continue by diverting temporary records to the Philadelphia Record Center. Um, we bought ourselves some more time. A couple of years ago, we came very close to saying, hey, we have to start diverting to Atlanta, um, which agencies in the D.C. area uh, weren't super happy about. Um, but uh, we've avoided that so far, and we think we can make that through 2018 at least. So. Um, continuing that diversion um, from of temporary records, you all still submit your 135s to the Washington National Records Center, um, and then they process them, and the temporary records go through Washington National Records Center up to Philadelphia, or some agencies have chosen to go straight to Philadelphia. 
Um, we started another diversion. I said we had some tight record centers out west. The Denver FRC um, is, is very tight on space. And so um, beginning October 1, um, temporary records that are not from Colorado in the states that, that uh, Denver Record Center serves. So we're talking New Mexico, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. Those temporary records are now going to go to the Linux FRC in the same kind of process I described above, where the 135 or the portal born transfer request goes to the Denver FRC. They do the processing, but then the records are going to be sent on to the Linux FRC. Other than that, we think we can keep up the, the record centers stay, staying in their boundaries. We want to serve the boundaries as much as we can. Um, so you know who your record center is and have some confidence that that record center will take your records and not another record center. Uh, one of the reasons we do diversions in this manner with one record center processing the 135s and then they go elsewhere is so your reference requests are more seamless. You can see your transfers in both record centers, and ultimately if the diversion ends and the records can come back to your, quote, home record center, you'll be set and, and better, uh, better situated for dealing with having some of your records in one locale and some in another. Um, so more on the space update. Next slide, please, Gordon. You might have inferred from what I was saying the transshipments are likely to increase. Um, we need to support the WNRC diversion and those other field FRCs. We've typically used a model of low reference, high volume, and, and that means and often those were palletized records, um, especially if they were frozen. Uh, there's fewer and fewer of those around, so we're starting to think of different ways that we might want to um, deal with transshipment and move records out of our field record centers um, and, and bring into question that low-reference, high-volume paradigm. Um, so one of the ones is non-responding disposal, and really we're talking – if it's something other than low reference, high volume, then we're not going to put it on pallets. We're going to put it on shelves in another record center. Um, so uh, it's a little bit of a difference. Which web record center has space? Let's put it on their shelves. What should we put on their shelves? Non-responding disposal is one of the highest ones at our list. And, and if I was in uh, uh, the McGowan Theater today, I'd give you all the evil eye or something. Because um, D.C.'s got a problem. I don't know why D.C. doesn't want to sign off on disposal. Uh, but to give you a conservative estimate, we've got 450,000 feet of backlog disposal. And that means nothing in, that's maybe is in disposition generated for up to two years. So we've asked more than two years ago. We've maybe asked multiple times. We've never got an answer. Um, there's about 450,000 cubic feet of it nationwide. 200,000 of it is in Washington National Record Center. So, again, out of all the records in the nation, you know, a, a, a system that's got almost 30 million feet in it, um, you guys are, are about 40% of the problem of not responding to disposal by volume. So, you know, if you won't respond, we're going to ship your records to the middle of the country. Might be a response on our part. But there's some other things we might do as well. We've got some other paradigms we're thinking about uh, in terms of getting records to where their final disposition is going to be, if records are supposed to be accessioned into, say, College Park or uh, Archives Drive or Archival Facility in St. Louis. Um, why not get them there first if they have the room and they're sitting in a different record center now that has a space problem? Um, so some other things may also start driving us related to preservation or final archival accessioning, as long as it can benefit our space situation uh, in these tight record centers. Um, <clears throat> so next slide, please. So I haven't gotten through disposal. I want to describe briefly the changes that are going on in our disposal process. We're, we're rolling out this disposal module in Arcus, and we've been piloting on the record center side. There's really sort of three pieces to it. There's our initial review piece. There's um, the agency's receipt of, of the notifications. Then the agency goes through its review, uh, where they usually typically have had 90 days or so to do that in. Um, and then the records are returned to us, and, and we do a final review. And we, we talked about this a few years ago, and our big goal here is to 
stop that review at the front end, where we used to do a very deep dive, pull up the SF-135, the transfer documentation, and closely compare the 135 against Arcus to see if there were any miskeyings or anything like that. You remember, some of our records have been in our system 20, 30, 40 years. You really, before you want to be up for disposal, you really did want to check this stuff closely. But it was also a hangover, uh, those who know our longer history. Up through the 90s, we used to have a something called a reversal of presumption dis- procedure on disposal, which said, and this was, again, when OE was paying for all of the record center program, we'd say it to an agency, if we don't hear from you in 90 days, we're going to throw your records out, which is a pretty aggressive approach. Cost ta- save the taxpayer a lot of money, um, but... And, you know, the record centers ended up throwing out records without agency approval sometimes. Um, and eventually an agency pushed back on that, and they decided to change that procedure. Um, and now, of course, we never destroy anything uh, without your signature, and, and even more so that's appropriate in a, in a revolving fund situation instead of an OE situation. But the point I'm trying to make is this very extensive review was done at a time when we were being risky about disposal, we would throw things out without your signature. Now we won't do it unless we have your signature. The risk is down because you're looking at it as well in all cases. Um, So the goal here is then to flip the process so that we do our deep dive review after you you as an agency have concurred in the disposal. What we're going to do is have a number of automated checks. We've boosted up our ARCA system um, to make sure everything is in order um, with that transfer as far as we can tell in an automated way. And then we flag all the uh, transfers that seem to have some kind of uh, math problem or missing some data or an invalid disposal authority, and we have the uh, record center during its review revol- resolve those. Um, but that only is maybe 20 or 30 percent of the transfers instead of the 100 percent where we were doing this full review on. We'll send the notices off to you. You'll return the notices, uh, and then we'll do this deep dive review where we actually pull up the SF-135 and make that comparison. And I keep saying pull up the SF-135. I think this is going to be an exciting development in our process. If you're in the ARCUS portal right now and you have records up for disposal, whether you're doing disposal in the portal or not, because that's still just coming, our process now is to attach a copy of the SF-135 in ARCUS. So any records that's up for disposal or is up for accessioning, you can have the expectation that if you go into the portal, you can find the 135 associated with that. Now, that's not the be-all and end-all of disposal review, uh, but some agencies have lost their 135s over time, so it's reassuring to know what the 135 is. It may help you in figuring out who on your side should do the, do the disposal review. Sometimes the 135 provides complete enough information to do disposal. Box lists aren't attached. Remember, for temporary records, it's not a requirement. You send them to the record center. So we don't have all your box lists, but we have all your 135s, or 99.9% of them, and we're attaching them, and they're available for for you there. So um, although the disposal module is not going to be fully implemented until um, the beginning of the next fiscal year as far as the agency participation. The record center is out in front of this. So the disposal notices you're about to receive uh, beginning January 1 will have gone through um, this change disposal process. Less review up front, more review at the back end. We'll still, before we throw any record out, get that 135 out and compare everything really closely and make sure all the data is in ARC is correct. But at that time, we'll already have in hand your disposal concurrence. Um, so those 40% or so who are not answering us, we're, we're going to expend a lot less effort on them. Um, so you all as agencies should be receiving a letter this week or certainly before the end of the new year um, from FRCP uh, describing this process change, and we'll attach that letter with all disposal notices that are going out the rest of 2017. So you'll understand we've done a little less review on the front end. You may have a little higher number of of transfers you don't concur in, um, but uh, ultimately we'll do the same review. And, of course, the thought here is to keep costs down and not pass those higher costs on to you um, with, for instance, those 120,000, 130,000 kill transfers we still have to review out there and all sorts of other things. If we can get them out to you and expend time later, that'll be the process. 
Um, the agency letter or communication that's going out um, describing the change in process will also describe how agencies uh, can get on board with the uh, ARCIS disposal module. Um, so if you'll go to the slide called ARCIS disposal module, the next one. All right, so John McAvoy gave you a few heads up on uh, what's going on there. I think people will be real excited about this. I think it's going to speed up the whole process. Agencies call me now and they say, hey, I want to destroy my records. And I say, oh, I can get you in my next disposal cycle, which is right now, maybe July, maybe the October disposal cycle. You'll see your notices maybe April, maybe July. Um, and, you know, everyone says, well, I got the money now, I'm, you know, I want to destroy it now. So it's a slow-moving process. We think it will be able to speed it up a lot more because we can push those things across to you uh, with less review uh, if you come to us with the backlog. Hey, if it meets all the criteria uh, that our, our automated edits are doing, um, all those transfers could be on your side in the portal within a couple days. Um, pretty cool. And you could start signing off on them. And then the ones that have problem, we could, we could review on and so forth. So the process will speed up. Um, there's two pieces of this. John described a communication module and a disposal module. The communication module is a pilot really for communication, uh, which means automated emails, um, from ARCAS for all our lines of business. But we're doing disposal first because we were already developing um, the disposal module, so we could piggyback on that. But eventually, we'd roll out a communication module for reference, a uh, communication module for incoming transfers, and so forth. So there's key points when something happened, you can set yourself up to receive an email. If it was the reference line of business and, say, a file wasn't found, you could have yourself set up to get an email that says, hey, the file's not found. You wouldn't have to go into Arcus and look. You'd immediately get it on your desktop. So we, we have four statuses we're going to be doing communications in in the module. Um, notification finalized, you get an email, hey, your disposal notices are in the queue for you. Uh, disposition approved, you concurred, agency, you send it back to us, and then we're going to do that deep dive review, then we're going to approve your concurrence. You can get an email saying, yeah, we concurred, and, and, and it's approved. Um, disposal canceled. You non-concur, you get an email back, saying, hey, uh, we did the ARCUS updates and, and your transfer was put back to shelved because you didn't concur in the destruction. Uh, similarly, during our deep dive review, uh, if we decided it wasn't ready for destruction and we put it back to shelved, you'd get a notification. And then the final one, agency records officers would, might be most excited about this one. Uh, dispose of completed, you'd actually get an email when that transfer left our dock for the destruction disposal mill. Um, so you'd actually have some documentation that has existed before on what day your records were actually destroyed that could come to you. All of these could be individual emails or you can set yourself up for digests. Some of these things you might want to know, some you might not want to know. Um, I, if I was a records officer, I'd be pretty excited about the last two. Uh, I'd probably have uh, disposal canceled as individual emails. Ought to be a relatively small number of transfers. So I'd get an email saying, hey, that transfer is canceled. Disposal completed. I might set that up for a digest, get a quarterly list of everything that's been destroyed um, during the quarter. Uh, so pretty exciting, but actually not the most exciting part of this. Um, the disposal module is going to be the, the most exciting part of this, um, where you all are going to be able to receive these notices um, and route them uh, to other reviewers within your organization who can either recommend the disposition or if you've given them that right, approve disposition. Um, or they can come back to you and you approve the disposition. So we've got about three more slides we can go through quickly, Gordon, that are just uh, views of the screen. The first one called Arcus Disposition Menus um, shows uh, what the um, agency records officer or um, Arcus uh, individual who's, who's handling this within your agency would see that they can approve notices in there, um, they can reassign notices, they can approve what we're calling lots, which are groups of records. Right now, um, we define the lot, but we're working on an update before the thing rolls out where you might be able to define the lot, uh, which I think will give agencies a lot of flexibility. Let's say I'm a departmental records officer and I've got 
I get all the notices sent to me and I have eight different agencies underneath me, maybe I want my lots to be separate record groups. Right now, we send them to you as eight different record groups, um, and, and you could handle those lots. What we're looking at is giving you more power to, to, to drive that even further. Let's say you might want to break those record groups down by disposal authorities because they represent different programs, and you might be able to do that. It's pretty excited about that. Um, next slide is the notifications, Arcus Disposition Notifications. And what you're looking at there is an individual transfer. Um, there's a pull down. It's in notification finalized. We, we put it out there for you. If you're the agency, you can either pull that down and concur or non-concur. And then if you non-concur, you give us a comment. You have a comment on, on why you're non-concurring. Um, <clears throat> so with those lots, you know, doing it one by one is pretty painful. If you have a lot, you go through and non-concur the seven transfers or ten transfers that you don't want destroyed, and then you can, in a, in a mass update, uh, approve all the rest of the lot. Let's say there's, you know, 300 transfers, three of them or nine of them I'm not approving. I mark out those three or nine, then I approve all the rest. Um, so you won't have to do a one-by-one -one process. So that looks, looks like it's going to be useful for you all. And then uh, the last Arcus slide shows Arcus disposition detail, and that is the um, what it looks like in an individual transfer. You can drill down on each individual transfer. There are hot links, and you can find the data about the transfer, what the authority is, what the dates are, how to. So you can see down there in the bottom left attachment name. That's where you'd find the 135 that's attached in there, and so forth. Um, Last slide is disposal module implementation. Um, so uh, we've implemented our first phase on this disposal review starting October 1, changing that process around where we're doing less review at the front end and more review at the back end. Um, we've got three pilot agencies John mentioned. They're going to receive their notices in the portal for those reviews uh, after the new year, January 2nd. Those three pilot agencies will we'll actually be receiving their notices um, electronically. Um, the letter that you all are going to get says that Arcus version 2.0 agencies can sign up to use um, the disposal module, Start uh, make your intent known to John McAvoy and your account manager. Um, we'll have training videos. We'll get you configured and all set up. And then the idea is we'll deliver the first notices to you all on, on the 1st of October uh, 2017, the beginning of, of October 2018, um, and uh, uh, away you'll go. Uh, you know, agencies that aren't in the portal, you're going to just get your regular notices the same way you have always gotten them, except the process will have been a little bit different. Uh, less review up front, more review at the back end. That's what I've got. Um, I think you guys usually reserve questions for the end, but I'll take any now. It's up to Gordon. Thanks for being the slide guy, Gordon. Sure, no problem. Uh, any questions online or in the room for uh, Scott <coughs> on any of his comments? Any online? Okay. Scott, doesn't seem to be uh, any questions in the room or uh, online, so uh, thanks for uh, calling in. And uh, uh, we appreciate it, and we'll continue to move on. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm going to hang up. All right. Next, we'll have Gary Rochfuss, uh, who will bring us an update on the records management training program. Good morning, everybody. And uh, two topics for me today. One, the uh, recent bulletin that we released on records management training requirements. Um, some of you may have attended the senior agency official meeting a few weeks ago, so it'll be a little repeat on that. And then I also wanted to take a, a little bit of a walk through our new learning management system with you. Um, not necessarily to focus so much on the details, but to, um, to answer some of the questions that are coming up. Um, we'll have it recorded, so if uh, you're getting questions from folks in your agencies about what's going on, we'll have it on the video and you can just point them back to that, uh, as, also, as well as also get your questions and feedback on both of these topics. So with that, uh, the recent bulletin on training, um, a little history on this, the, it comes out of uh, two areas, really. Uh, the email memorandum that was done several years ago by OMB and NARA um, required us to form a training work group and look at what are the training requirements for federal agencies. Uh, we were fairly deliberate 
in, in working through that to make sure that if we were going to establish a deeper level of requirements other than just what's in the, the Code of Federal Regulations, that we, we did that carefully, that we weren't creating another training requirement for the whole federal workforce without understanding the implications of that. Um, we also took a deep look at, at who really needs training. And at the end of the day, what we tried to do in the bulletin was craft language that essentially says, if you have personnel working in your agencies that deal with records, they need to understand what they're doing. So there may be some folks in your agency that don't fall into that. That's a judgment you should be making. And then we were very clear, given all the, the challenges we have with electronic messaging, uh, that if somebody has an agency email account, they must get training on records management within 60 days of arriving at the agency to ensure that we're not losing electronic records very quickly as they get into systems, because that's, that's a problem that we all know exists and see recurring. We also put in there a requirement that training will be annual. Now, we didn't put any kind of time on it or any, any distinction about how you do that or how deep you go. So we tried to put the requirements in here in a way that's very flexible for each agency to interpret what's the best thing for their workforce with all of us understanding that the intent is to make sure that our employees know what they need to do with their records and are not inadvertently destroying things that shouldn't be or not keeping track of things in a way that makes effective and efficient practices for the agency. So there's a list in the bulletin of roughly 15 topics. Um, we spent some time looking at training that you all are already doing. So examining what are agencies currently doing, looking at our own policies and trying to make the best decision about what's the balance that is the minimum for every employee to ensure that they understand their responsibilities and kind of the fundamental practices that they need to be doing with records in the agency. Um, and we didn't, we didn't go into how deep these need to be, right? So in some cases, you might look at a requirement on that list and go, I can meet that requirement in two sentences in training. It's that simple. Or you might decide for your particular application and, and a part of your workforce, they might need two or three screens of an e-learning product to get at the depth that you want. So again, think about how deep you go, that's up to you. What the goal is though, we have to keep in mind, people need to know how to manage their records and take appropriate action. That's the end goal we're all striving for, not necessarily so worried about the path you take to get your workforce to that goal. And then we also put some recommendations about how to do this. So immediately, often the reaction is, Here's another mandatory training that everybody has to do that's another requirement on top of all the things we have to have. Well, maybe not. Maybe the way that you decide to do this is to integrate these training requirements in training that you already have in your agencies. So an example might be if you're gonna worry about how do we deal with electronic records, maybe that needs to be integrated into your information technology training. If we're going to deal with other things related to disposal, maybe there's another training. The more that you can integrate these requirements into things that already employees get related to how they do their job, the more effective it will be. If you build another requirement that's a standalone that doesn't connect to the actual work I do in the agency, you're going to be less effective in people understanding how to apply it to their day-to-day -day work. Um, and we're certainly happy to, to work with you and provide some recommendations directly on, on how to do that. Um, another recommendation is don't go alone. So the design of training has a huge impact on its effectiveness. In your human capital departments, you should have instructional systems specialists that are trained instructional designers. That's what they've spent their life studying. Use that expertise to get you a great training product instead of just delivering another slide deck to somebody and saying, read it, and hoping that they learn from it. So take advantage of the talents you have in your own organizations. If you don't have that talent or you're, you're looking for other guidance, you can always reach out to me. Happy to have our staff work with you directly in trying to improve your products and make the training more effective for you and your agencies. Um, and then the last one here, really look at where can you differentiate in your workforce the right training. So what your senior executives need is different than what the average employee might need. 
The more you can build training that speaks to the role that person performs in the agency, how they use records, their role in records management, the more effective it'll be, the more likely you'll see the behavior change that causes improvement in records management. There's a cost to all that, we certainly recognize it. So, you know, we're not looking for necessarily an overnight solution. And we also stand ready to help you with all of that. So a year and a half ago, we built a generic training module for the Federal Records Officer Network that is free for everyone to use. I think at this point, one agency has already reviewed that against these requirements, and I think they had to add one screen to that training. Um, so we're happy to work with you to do those products to look at where there's, where there's a congregation of needs that's common enough that it makes sense for the whole federal workforce to invest together. Uh, we're also happy to build products directly for you if that's what you need. So we've been doing some work for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau the last couple of years, as well as for the Defense Media Activity where they've come to us with training that they want developed for them. Uh, we, we were able to do that fairly effectively for them. So again, we're here with you to support you in these new requirements. Um, again, it's not necessarily a big new thing, right? You all have been doing the majority of this. The difference is now it's clearly laid out of what the minimum requirement is in terms of topics. Bring. So uh, big change for us in November. We switched from the learning management system we've been using for the past 10 years to a new one. Um, we did that transition over a really rapid time frame, roughly six weeks. So you'll see some things continue to evolve from us, but I wanted to go some th through a few things that are very, very different than the old system that um, can be challenging if, if you didn't read the memo we sent out. Um, so on the screen, it's just a look and feel. I want to point out the text at the bottom, though. Um, used to be our old system was very different for our internal use, our external, not so much anymore. If you're looking for somebody to just browse the courses and what we offer, you have to use the first link shown here. If you go to the second link, you're going to get to a login screen and nothing else. All right, so important there. Once you come in here on that first link, we've put a button there to make it easy for you to find the course catalog. Click on that. You'll see all the courses we're offering. You can browse through that all that you want until the point where you start trying to register for something. At that point, if you don't have an account, you're going to get to that login screen and not be able to move forward. All right, so also here is then the create an account button here for you, as well as some help on the screen. So we've built some job aids that are available from the information center, the guide, everything you need to do in the system. Um, again, easy to, easy to follow them if you find them to begin with. And we're going to work on trying to make that more intuitive with the way the screen's designed. Um, but I want to point that out to you. And again, if you need an account, there's the create button account there. We are redesigning the other login screen, so it'll be a little bit more easier to do it from that screen also, but I think it's going to be another week before our contractor has that done. Very different for your folks when they come in in terms of what they see. Um, if they are scheduled for a class with us, it would show up in their upcoming sessions. And you also see um, in the training items below things they've already done. There's some, some significant changes we've made in how we do our business now. So one of them is um, if you took the certificate of file records management training with us before, everything was separate. All my classes are separate, my tests are separate. I really don't have to worry about how they fit together in the system. That caused a lot of challenges for us with the reporting. So we have now built a curriculum that contains all those items together. And when someone creates an account in our part of the system, they're automatically going to be assigned that curriculum. If they never complete it, that's fine, it doesn't matter but allows us to very quickly and accurately track where they are in that. So if you were to open that for the people to come in, what you're gonna see is that all six knowledge areas are there. Each knowledge area has the course and a test, so they can sign up for it right there if they want to, find the session, and they're also able to track their progress very quickly right there for themselves if they're trying to complete the whole certificate. Another difference is we're moving all of our course evaluations online. So after people complete the courses, they are not going to get their course certificate for that course until they complete the evaluation. So you see here where next to KA3 you have the evaluate button. Click that, you'll get an electronic evaluation. It takes you as little as five minutes potentially to complete. Once you submit that, that button is going to change to view certificate 
and you can now print your certificate for that particular course. Another change, you used to be able to take your tests whenever you wanted for all the courses, right? Well, as we started looking at our data and preparing for this transition, we found what I consider a little bit of an alarming trend. Uh, people that were choosing to take all the tests, either before they took a single course or after they might have taken one or two courses. In fact, a couple of weeks ago I was teaching, and I had um, one of your senior agency officials um, asking to leave the course early. Okay, things come up. And her justification to me was, well, I've already taken a test, the test, so why do I need to be here? So one of the things we've elected to do is recognize that you probably shouldn't be just taking the test to take the test and pass the test, that the learning aspect of this should be more important, but that's a challenge sometimes. So you're not going to be able to take your tests until you've completed the course, and we have said you've completed the course. Our old system, the day the course was scheduled to end, automatically gave you course completion. The system does not. Our instructors have to go in there and do an attendance check for you. So folks will have roughly a delay of 12 to 24 hours while we get that processed. Once the attendance is complete, you'll be able to do your course evaluation. And then you'll also have access to activate and take your test. So we're trying to increase a little bit of the rigor in, in how we do this to promote a better learning experience and promote people to try to learn more for the course rather than just trying to get the credential that they might want. So at the end of all that, hopefully you'll wind up with this. For those that are looking for a certificate, very quick and easy to see, hey, I've done it all, I'm complete 100%. And oh, by the way, it now allows us to generate a report very quickly and hopefully get your certificates out to you faster. Um, gonna be a little lag in that, we're still working with the system to um, clean up data from October through November, so I think we'll be back to sending certificates out in January. Apologize for those of you that may have been, lack, have been impacted by that for the delay, um, but really trying to get this data cleaned up has been really a challenge for us. Put it in context, we had roughly 46,000 accounts in the old system. After we went through and tried to get rid of the stuff that didn't have any valuable learning history, we imported about 16,000 accounts into the new system. A lot of that was people that would forget their login and create another account. We found people that had 15 accounts in our old system. So you'll see in my tips later on, I'm gonna encourage people not to do that. We've put some controls in the system, but not that somebody doesn't always figure out how to work around those things, right? Um, we can't give you accurate reports or generate them for the archivist if we can't put your data into a single identity. And we're still working with individuals now that are, that are coming into the system and recognize things are missing. Yeah, things are missing because you had accounts with two completely different names. And as a logical human being, I didn't make that connection and bring your data over. Now we can work on that, but first we gotta validate that what you're telling me is accurate because some of it doesn't pass the common sense test sometimes. Another difference will be, uh, we will be using a shopping cart for you to check out, period. In its current configuration, the only option you'll have, you see them, is to choose invoice. In the coming weeks, or roughly, I think, a month to two months at the latest, there'll also be an option to choose credit card. So if you are having a credit card or holder in your agency pay for the training, great, you'll be able to do all this automated without contacting our staff at all for you to get into the class. If you're not doing that and you still need to send us a form and another payment method, that option's always gonna be there with the invoice. So again, trying to look at ways to speed things up for you. So when you select a class here, or your class session, the only option you will have is to add it to the cart. You'll do that. It'll pop up here. You can go back to shopping, add more items if you want more courses, or you proceed to check out just like you would on Amazon. Here you'll select your payment method. Again, for the moment, it's only gonna say invoice. We will, we'll send you an email with that payment form, right? You'll send it back to us currently. As soon as we can get the credit card module tested and positive that it's working accurately, we'll enable that. And then you'll have, be able to do that without engaging that. It'll be, I think, far more efficient. I think roughly 80% of our transactions end up being credit card anyhow. The difference is we're manually processing them for you right now which makes it slower for you, slower for us. So a lot easier for you down the road. 
Um, you'll then process, place your order, right? That completes it. You'll get a confirmation. What the system is then doing is saying, in the system, you're gonna see I'm pending payment as my process for the course. And you're also gonna get an email from the system with our payment form. Gives you the option of sending us credit card information, SF-182 so we can process an IPAC. All those ways that we've been traditionally doing that, that doesn't change. Um, but we have turned the shopping cart on right away so that we all know this is where we're going. It's all consistent. And then down the road, when we enable the credit card option, it's the same way for you. So here you'll see that pending payment status. We will get your payment when you send it to us. You'll fax that in still like we've been doing. Our folks will process it. When they process it, they'll go into the back end of the system, say, yes, we've got you paid, and you will now become registered into that class. Um, so pretty straightforward on the process, but again, it can be a little bit um, daunting or unnatural sometimes for folks to go, well, wait a second, I don't wanna check out when I'm not the one paying for this course right now or what's really going on with this. So if someone inadvertently does that, it's not really an issue. We can back out of it completely for them once we know it's there. Um, and again, down the road, you're gonna wanna get really cozy with whoever your credit card holder is because you're gonna have them right there next to you or on the phone so that they can right there, enter their credit card information, be done with it. Quicker for them, quicker for you. Couple other changes. Um, we constrained the system, so regardless of what your username was in our old learning management system, it is now your email address. If you had multiple email addresses you were using in the old system and you're not sure, probably best to contact us. Uh, we may or may not have chosen automatically which one to keep and which ones to get rid of, or we might have multiple ones in the system still. Um, so great to let us know. Please, please, please do not create another account, All right? So you think, well, I don't remember my old account, I'll just create a new one. Um, creates problems for you when you can't get your certificate because you created, you completed a, a course and a few tests in one account, and now you want to finish and those ones are missing that you did in the other account, and you don't understand why you're not getting credit. So please don't do that. Um, we also have a habit of your training coordinators wanting to get in the system, create an account for themselves, and then somehow magically sign everybody up for training. The person that's going to training has to have the account. They have to be the one that's registered for, registered for training. If you are doing a large group of people, contact us. We may be able to work with your training coordinator to do that in a more efficient way than um, each person doing it individually. We can work with you. Um, but please, let's try not to have your training coordinators creating accounts just for the sake of trying to sign someone else up for training. Um, ultimately, that costs all of us money that we're not using because each one of those accounts is an annual license we're paying for. And then there's no training history there, so it essentially was wasted. Um, layaways, right? So this is a, a one that's unique. We have people that are putting um, all six courses for the certificate in their shopping cart. And then when we get their payment for them, they're going, well, I only want to pay for one right now. We can't separate that transaction, right? So it'd be like you going to Amazon and going, I'm buying 10 books, but when I go to check out, I'm only going to send you the payment for the first one, and I'll get around to paying for the others later. The system doesn't do it. So please only register for what you're able to pay for at that moment in time. Um, if you want to get ahead of Another course, let's say you want to make sure you got a seat in one four months from now, do that as a separate transaction. So if you're doing K2 in January, that's the one you can pay for. Proceed to checkout, check that out, have that as its own entity. Then if you want to do K4 in April, go back in, now do K4 as a separate shopping cart transaction. Pay for them separate, no problem with that. Remember though, your seat is not actually confirmed in that course until we receive payment, all right? Again, Gritz, uh, emphasize this, get to know your credit card holder, because down the road, once that, that checkout system is turned on with credit cards, it's gonna be so efficient for you, uh, much easier. And then there's job aids, again, to do the common things on the site, so it's whether it's changing your user profile, how to register for a course, all that's in that section, um, and let us know if there's things that you're trying to do that, you know, are confusing or we need to add job aids for. 
Um, so that's uh, what I've got for today. Any questions about the bulletin or um, learning management system or any feedback from early experiences that you or your folks might have had with that? Go ahead, Shannon. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see, we'll start down here. Um, what is the name of the learning management system that you're using? So the vendor that we're using is Cornerstone On Demand. And the, um, you know, we've done the typical thing where we've put NARA in front of their normal address. So it's uh, nara.csod.com. If you're trying to log in, if you don't have a login, please look at the slides, use that other URL. Okay. Um, another question is, um, are you thinking about offering a course online regarding records retention and disposition schedules um, and the life, cy life cycle of records? So I would say we probably already do. Um, the life cycle is really covered in darn near every course we offer. Records retention schedules really are the primary place where we do that is in Knowledge Area 3 and the implementation with disposition in Knowledge Area 4. Um, both of those are covered in kind of less detail for like a custodian and the basic records operations course. Um, but if you have more detailed questions on that, you can just email me at gary.rockfuss at nara.gov. Be happy to look at that cl more closely with you. Make sure we're meeting your needs. We have a whole host here, so I can well, keep going. Well, let's go in the room <laughs> and then we'll come back to you, Shannon. Yes. Hi, uh, I registered for a class at the, uh, the, uh, the Maryland uh, say, yeah. Uh, College Park. Yeah, and um, once I uh, registered for the class, uh, I noticed that the DC location had uh, all from uh, K2 to K6. I was unable to, uh, to remove that College Park uh, uh, registration. How do I go about doing that? So I think for the moment, you're gonna need to email us. Once the, once the payment has been processed, the user doesn't have the option of withdrawing it right now because there's not a way to refund that or transfer the funding to another. When we get to the point where, again, we're doing this by credit card, you'll be able to do that yourself because the system will automatically refund the credit card if that's what you're choosing to do. So some of the mechanics of that we still have to work out, but it, if you're in a situation where you can't do what you want to do, just send us an email. We'll be happy to make sure we get it done for you. Anyone else in the room? A couple more. And Gordon, let me know on time when we need to move on, so we'll answer any other questions offline after that. I have a question. Um, in the past, you guys had mentioned that you sometimes offer coming out to locations, like to different agencies. Is that still an option for us? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. We will always try to come to you as long as you've got a sufficient number of students. And again, if you don't for just your agency, but you're willing to host it, we'll put that course in our system, advertise it, and see if we can get up to the the number of students that makes sense for us to do. Usually we're looking for roughly 15 um, per class, but you know we, we look at the financial part of what the whole thing is and try to make the decision based on that. If you're doing classes back to back, we can offer, often get that 15 down somewhere to closer to 10 um, because the travel costs are a one time usually for my trainer and it works out the balance. All right, uh, let's do one more online and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Okay, um, just to confirm, because I'm assuming this might be a question other folks have too. Um, just to confirm, if you've previously completed the certificate curriculum in the past, you don't need to redo the modules, correct? It doesn't matter that it's in the new system. Correct, and in fact, um, if we got your data transfer right, and I'm gonna be frank and going, we know it's not perfect because of trying to make sense out of what was there. Um, you should be able to go into the new system with using your email account, and you'll see you're 100% for that certificate. And there's roughly, when I ran the report last week, there was roughly 3,500 people that are in the system with a complete certificate. Um, yeah, there's some gaps, and if you've completed it and you find a gap, again, email us. We'll go look at the old data, make sure we make the corrections, and get your account updated for you. 
Well, thanks, everybody. And again, if you have other questions, just send them to me in the email offline. And, and Shannon, I'll follow up with you to, to grab whatever else was in chat and make okay. sure we can respond to them. So thank you. Have a great holiday, everyone. Folks that had chat questions, um, I can't see your email addresses, so please email us at rm.communications at nara.gov um, so that we have your response email address and Gary can get back to you directly. Okay. Hey, Don. Riddle's next. I'm going to do that. Okay. All right. All right, next we're gonna have uh, Mark Riddle from uh, ISU's office and he'll bring uh, an update on the uh, controlled unclassified information. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Mark Riddle from the Information Security Oversight Office here located at the National Archives. Of course, if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation, I think we have mics at the end. Of course, my email address will be at the end of the presentation. I encourage everybody to forward any questions to me uh, uh, in regard to the presentation. Okay, um, this is what we're gonna be covering today in regard to the CUI program. Of course, we're gonna start out with the executive order, 13556, go into the 32 CFR 2002, which is our implementing directive. And uh, really, we're going to be talking about what the CUI program means to you going forward. It is going to be a, a change in, in regard to information security, so you may have a lot of questions. But again, uh, I'll try my best to answer the questions in the room and also online, but also uh, please feel free to contact me directly. We're going to go a little bit into our approach to the contractor environment, which is really no mystery. We're going to use agreements, contracts and agreements is how we do business with others who are not part of our agencies. We're also going to talk about something called phased implementation, which is really how the program is going to be implemented across the entire executive branch. And believe me, you will be affected by the CUI program over the next couple of years because agencies are already ramping up for implementation and realigning, uh, I guess, the stars within the agencies to do a full-scale implementation effort. Also, we're going to go into some of the key features of the CUI program. This is really important going forward because really, when we talk about CUI, we're talking about information, the sensitive information that we're currently protecting in the government. So real quick, this is a, our opening statement, of course, why is the CUI program necessary? And usually, if I'm depending on the audience that I'm uh, addressing this to, uh, I usually ask the question, you know, does anybody think that the government, the executive branch is handling information, sensitive information in a good way? Do you think we're doing a good job or do you think we could probably do a better job? Now, most of the folks in the room, I'm not sure if folks have, uh, apologize for that, an active security clearance, but you'll know that over the past couple of years, the government, of course, has been hit with a number of data breaches, meaning that sensitive PII has been you know, extracted from the government and given to the bad guys. So really, when you think about the CUI program, one of its main purposes or why it's necessary is we want to keep incidents like that from happening again, or at least lessen the impact of those incidents on us. So let's think about right now, uh, I think we have representation from a number of federal agencies, executive branch agencies. Let's think about how folks are currently protecting information and what they're calling it. If you went around from agency to agency, you would find what I like to call alphabet soup as far as what we're calling this information. Within the Department of Defense, we call it FOU, or for official use only information. Department of State calls it sensitive but unclassified information. The Department of Agricultural, Agriculture, sensitive security information, or SSI. We have over 120 different types of information out there in the executive branch, and guess what? Every one of those types of information is defined differently and it's protected in different ways across agencies. So when you think about the CUI program, and this is one of our reoccurring themes, we really want to standardize not only what we're protecting as an agency or as a, as a government, but also create a baseline for how to protect that information. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time here because I want to talk about what happens when agencies protect information in different ways? Let's take, let's say the FBI, I like to pick on those guys. Let's say that they're protecting sensitive law enforcement information, which is unclassified, on a secure infrastructure like a JWIX or a CIPRNET, uh, basically a computer system that's programmed or, or configured to handle classified information. And let's say that they needed to share that information. Damn, I've really got to stop. I'm usually a walking and a talking kind of guy, so I talk with my hands a lot. I'm going to stand over here. So 
Uh, so you have an agency who's using a, a higher level of um, infrastructure to protect and share this information. Let's take you a, a smaller agency like the National Archives or even the Department of Transportation. And let's say that they needed to have access to this particular type of information in order to keep the planes in the air. So, of course, they would ask the FBI or the FBI would say, hey, we have some information that may be valuable to keeping planes and, you know, Americans safe in the air. And, of course, Transportation and the FAA would say, yeah, that's awesome. Please send it to us. Then, of course, the FBI would say, do you have a JWICS account or do you have classified infrastructure that we can use to send it to you? And then they would say, you know, no, we don't. And then they would say, well, I guess you ain't getting it then. And then bad things happen. So when you think about the CUI program, the main purpose of standardizing these protections is to ensure a level of protection that everybody can live with so that way timely dissemination of that actionable information can take place. Now, that's an extreme case. Now, of course, some of the folks in the room, and I suspect you've been around the government a little while, because I got a, a little bit of gray in my beard also. So the first time we all heard the term CUI, or Controlled Unclassified Information, was right after 9-11. Of course, the term back in that day was related to unclassified terrorism information. And of course, this was the beginning of the, the problem. We realized that not only were we sharing sensitive terrorism-related information poorly among government agencies, we were actually sharing and protecting unclassified information, all of it, in a bad way or inconsistent ways that actually led to impediments to this information sharing. So that brings us to the executive order. Now, the executive order was signed out by President Obama in November of 2010, but I had to give a shout out to when this term actually was created because it came about during the Bush administration right after 9-11. It just took some time for this program to get some legs under it, and of course it came to a head with um, Executive Order 13556. Now this regulation is only a three-page document, but it does a couple of things, and I like to, if you can imagine a line being drawn in the sand. It is the executive branch's recognition that we handle sensitive information poorly and something needs to be done about it. And that something, of course, is the CUI program. So again, this is a three-page document and it does a couple of important things and I want to work my way from the, the bottom up. First things first, we needed to identify what we were protecting in the government. So what the executive order did is it, it defined CUI broadly. It says that we in the, as an executive branch are only going to protect information that we can link back to a law, regulation, or a government-wide policy. That's basically the high-level definition of CUI. That's what we should be protecting right now. So when you think about it, why did we need to make this declaration inside of the executive order of what we were protecting, basically limiting the scope to only things that we could tie to real laws and regulations and government-wide policies? Because right now, it's kind of the Wild West out there. You can imagine that you have you know, a lot of agencies and you have operational components within those agencies that are basically reaching out, touching an information type or a data set and saying, we are going to protect this as for official use only or sensitive but unclassified information. That's the problem. I almost knocked it over again. I can, I'm going to move it over here. There we go. <laughs> All right. I'm not even supposed to have water here, so nobody tell anybody. So, um, so that was it. The CUI program is house cleaning. We really wanted to limit the scope of what we were protecting to only those categories. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means, because when I say I want you to protect all information types that you can link back to a law, regulation, and government-wide policy, that probably means absolutely nothing to you. But really, the CUI program took it a step further, and I'm going to go into that in the next couple slides. Now, of course, we need somebody to lead the charge for the CUI program, because this is a major information security reform. It's probably one of the most significant security reforms in the past 50 years, since the first time we really put legs or a frame around the classified program. This is that type of reform. It's the Wild West out there, and we really need to reel agencies in, establish a baseline that everybody can live with. So, of course, the president designated the National Archives and Records Administration to lead this charge, and we call ourselves the executive agent, meaning that our job is to oversee agency actions to implement this program, which includes oversight, which is where I come in. I, inside of the National Archives, I work for an office called the Information Security Oversight Office, and I'm the lead for oversight, which basically means that I'll be going out and assessing agencies' efforts to implement this program. Now, now let's focus our attention to the top portion of this slide. Of course, the executive order established the CUI program, and then a sub-bullet is, it says, 
in consultation with affected agencies. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that ISU and NARA, we could not develop this program in a vacuum. Even though we know a lot about information security and we think we, we consider ourselves the experts, don't laugh, but we do, we think we know a good deal about protecting sensitive information, namely classified. Um, but the president said, you know, you need to work with agencies because there was recognition that some agencies actually got it right when it came to information security. And some agencies, of course, were crazy. You know, some agencies were requiring, you know, uh, classified infrastructure to store and transmit their sensitive information. And others were just saying, let's put it behind a locked door, maybe a fax cover sheet. That'll be sufficient. So somewhere between those extremes, we find the CUI program. So when we say in consultation with affected agencies in the government, what that really means is that we need to hold a couple working group meetings. We need to do a series of data calls. And we need to start out with what we're currently doing right now in the government. So there were two questions that came out of this data call. We asked agencies and our, our affected partners, first, what are you currently protecting and why? And the next question is, how are you protecting that information? And of course, the answer to those two questions actually form the CUI program. So as you go over these concepts, the things that I'm going to be going over today, you're going to find that there's some familiarity there. You're like, man, we already do that. Or we were actually thinking about doing that, but we didn't have somebody within the executive branch to tell us that it, now it's a requirement. So that's where we're at with the CUI program. Remember, two questions. What are you protecting and why? And of course, how are you protecting that information? And that forms the CUI program. So of course, we have something called a CUI registry, which is really the answer to that first question. We asked agencies, of course, what are you protecting right now that can be linked to law, regulation, and government-wide policy, and everything else. And of course, agencies throughout the executive branch submitted to us all the information types and the underlying authorities for why they were protecting it in the first place. And we racked and stacked it here at the National Archives and ISU, and we came up with something called a CUI registry. So earlier when I spoke about the executive order, we say that, of course, CUI is if an information type that can be linked to one of these authorities, right? That doesn't mean anything to anybody. But the CUI registry actually tells you what CUI is. It really comes down to 23 categories of information, of course, 84 subcategories, but focus in on the 23 categories of information. That's the world of CUI. When somebody asks you what CUI is, say, you know, it's the information categories listed on the CUI registry. A little bit about how this registry is maintained. Of course, it's maintained by the executive agent for the program, which is NARA and the, Nas or the Information Security Oversight Office, and it's based off of current laws, regulations, and government-wide policies. Think about the CUI registry as a catalog of what the executive branch should be protecting right now. This is what you should be protecting right now, and you probably are, for the most part, protecting those information types. Of course, the CUI registry is, is basically a website. It's publicly available, and it's supposed to be a resource for agencies when it comes to implementation. The idea here is that we want you to look at your existing policies and procedures, take a look at the information types. What are you currently protecting? And I want you to bounce them off of the CUI registry and the underlying authorities just to make sure that you have alignment, because right now there may not be you know, direct alignment to what you're currently protecting and what's listed in the CUI registry. And what that really means from an information security standpoint is that you may have an actual gap in protection, meaning that in order to protect it under the CUI program, you need to make it legal. You need to establish a law, regulation, or government-wide policy that actually calls for its protection. It can no longer be because some official within your agency reached out and touched that data set and said, please protect this. It needs to be a little bit stronger than that. So let's move right along to the 32 CFR 2002. Now this is the how we're protecting information. Of course, we asked agencies the how. Everything from how do you currently destroy this information? What do you mark it like? How do you share it? Do you encrypt it through email? These are questions that we had within agencies. Now has anybody ever seen that movie 12 Angry Men? It's a great movie about these guys were, you know, um, debating in a jury room about the guilt or innocence of somebody. And you got 12 guys in the room debating over guilt or innocence of this young boy. Now, the CUI program was kind of done like that. You can imagine that we had a room, a working group, that took six years to adjudicate. And we debated over everything from the color of a cover sheet to whether email encryption was required, also to how this information should be destroyed at the end of the day. Every aspect of this program was hotly debated. And we have here in front of us the 32 CFR 2002, which is the, the it is the work 
from that, or it is the product of that work together as agencies. So you're going to see things here that are familiar. You're going to see things here that um, may not quite align with your existing sensitive but unclassified information programs. Maybe you fall short of it. Maybe you exceed it. But this is the baseline for how this information should be protected in the government. Of course, I want to draw everybody's attention to the bottom bullet here. Now, what does it say? It says, emphasize the unique protections required in law, regulation, and government-wide policy. Now, think about the basis of CUI is that if an information type is called, called out in a law, regulation, or government-wide policy is requiring some kind of protection or dissemination control, that's basically CUI. But keep in mind that when we conducted an analysis of all these laws and regulations, we found that not all laws were created equal, meaning that there are certain laws out there that just say, here's an information type, please protect it. And then agencies went out and established what it meant to protect this information. But also, there are certain laws out there that were prescriptive in nature, meaning that they took it a step farther. They identified an information type, and they said, you know what? This is exactly how it should be marked and destroyed or even shared throughout the government. A good example is federal taxpayer information, which is a category of CUI. The IRS has issued very prescriptive regulations on how this information should be marked and even destroyed, and a couple of other juicy bits in there. So the CUI program does that. It recognizes where the laws are very prescriptive in nature, and it puts a magnifying glass over those laws and regulations to ensure that they're followed. But for the most part, when you think about the 32 CFR 2002, it defines protections when those laws are vague and when those laws are silent on protective measures. And I have to go into that a little bit because when these laws emphasize unique protections, they usually don't go into the entire protective scheme, meaning that they may be specified in nature because of a dissemination control, but that specified authority could be silent on how to protect it in the electronic environment. So when those laws are silent, we recognize the prescriptive nature of those laws, but when those laws are silent, the CUI program fills the void and defines protection. So brings us to the NIST SP-800-171. Of course, now we're in the guidance documents. We're in the how to protect CUI. First, this document is targeted towards non-federal organizations and, and systems. And this document was issued in June 2015. And I don't know if anybody picked up on it, but our regulation, the 32 CFR 2002, was issued in September and became effective November 14th of this year. This document was issued in June 2015, and it references CUI and protective measures for this information. Does anybody want to take a wild guess as to why we issued this document almost a year and a couple months ahead of our CFR? First, I'll tell you, I love just throwing a question out there and I answer it myself. It's awesome. But so, <laughs> so the government, we actually don't do anything unless we have to. We're very reaction reaction driven, meaning that you can imagine what was going on in the government in 2014 and 20, or 2013 and 2014, we were hit with a number of incidents, incidents that can be attributed, that were attributed to inconsistent safeguarding guidance given by agencies to non-federal entities on how to protect sensitive information and go a split, something bad happened. We were hit, major incidents were going on. Some of these incidents made it to the news, and of course, if it makes it to the news, it makes it to the White House. Of course, the White House got wind, or already they were very aware, that we were aggressively working to implement the CUI program, establishing a standard of protection. So we, we went down there and we talked to them, you know, and they said, what do you have? What do you have that can prevent this from happening, or at least make it seem to where it's not so bad? What is going to strengthen the protections around this information? So we were already thinking in the lines of creating a standard with the National Institute of Standards and Technology on how to protect CUI when it's entrusted to industry. So the White House basically said, you know, paraphrasing here, they said, give it a name, put it out for public comment, and fast track that sucker. So within six months, that regulation was on the street, ready for use by agencies, all in reaction to incidents that hit the government. Believe me that if the CUI program were fully implemented, the folks in the room who have active security clearances, you probably wouldn't have got that nice letter saying that you have credit monitoring for the next year. So this program will strengthen it. Everybody wants to know, what is the government going to do about these security breaches? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to go attack somebody? You maybe. It's not my department. But what we are going to do is we're going to strengthen the information protections around sensitive information. We're going to define what we're supposed to protect, and we're also going to lay out how that information should be protected. Now, of course, um, I don't know if we have any contracting folks in the room, but we do a lot of our work through contractors or industry. 
So the federal acquisition regulation will standardize the way in which we give guidance to non-federal entities when they work for us. So what you can expect is that, of course, a year from now, probably about November, December, there's going to be a federal acquisition regulation on the street which is going to reform the way in which we give guidance to industry. So hopefully everything will be standardized, everything will be security requirements that you can really wrap your arms around. Now, well, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. It's the implementation of the CUI program. Everybody wants to know, what do I have to do and when do I have to do it? And of course, this answers that question. I want to direct everybody's attention to the CUI website. Of course, we maintain um, a website, a number of documents. Of course, the CUI registry is there. Um, but we also issued a guidance document, a notice that speaks to the implementation of the CUI program. Basically, what do you have to do and when you have to do it? So this is a snapshot of that implementation. Of course, it really breaks down into five major elements policy, training, physical safeguarding, systems, and a self-inspection program. These are the nuts and bolts of every information security program in the government. Now, of course, coming right out of the box, we need to reform our policies. Because in the executive order and in the CFR, we, we point out that the reason we have inconsistent safeguarding practices in the government today is because agency policies tried their best to define protection, and we had an inconsistent patchwork system developed throughout the executive branch, and something needs to be done about it. So coming right out of the box, of course, within 180 days from November, which would put us about May, we expect agencies to develop and publish a policy that implements the CUI program. Now that is extremely aggressive, considering that it took us six years to develop the CFR, and we're asking agencies to develop the policy within six months. So ISU has developed a relief valve for agencies, meaning that you can tell us the status of your implementation efforts. We realistically don't expect every agency to have a policy in place in May because some agencies are very complex, they're very large, that sometimes they have internal review procedures that take over a year. But what we do expect is for agencies to have a very good idea about how long it's going to take them to have a policy in place come May. So right now every agency is scrambling to get their arms around CUI implementation and by May, there's going to be a data call issued to agencies to say, where are you at on policy? Where are you at on training? How's your physical safeguarding looking? That, that, expect that around May. Of course, there is an annual reporting requirement that'll start off next year. And every November, November 1st of every year, agencies will be required to report on the status of their implementation efforts. And of course, within agencies, we have uh, designated officials that we're going to be working with. Every agency will have a senior agency official for the CUI program and a program manager, or what I like to call them, the boots on the ground, the guy who's actually going to make sure that implementation takes place. So focusing again on this chart, of course, policy is what kicks it off. Agency policy is going to tell you, or it's going to feed right into your agency training. And why do, first, one question that folks may have, of course, is that, why do we need to develop all of these agency policies if agency policies are part of the problem? And it really comes down to the categories of information or the information types that are handled within agencies. Think about it really quick about, let's take the IRS. What type of information do they handle? Federal tax information. Think about the FBI. What do they handle? Law enforcement information. Social Security Administration. Privacy. HHS. Medical information. These agencies have a very unique mission and their information types kind of tie into that. So what we expect from an agency policy is to not only adopt the CUI program, but identify the unique information types that you handle. Because every agency is going to handle what we call CUI specified, meaning where the laws are prescriptive in nature, and we expect you to pull from those regulations the specified um, requirements that are found in those laws and regulations and put them in your agency policy so that way they have a shot at making it to your agency training. Now we're realists at the National Archives and even I see I'm very realistic. Nobody's going to read the executive order. Nobody's going to read the CFR and probably nobody's even going to read your agency policies no matter how much work you put into them. But everybody's going to have to suffer through CUI training. So keep that in mind, that whatever you put in your policy will make it to training, and then we actually make the change that we're hoping for in the CUI program. So of course, from a physical safeguarding level, or physical safeguarding from an implementation standpoint, we are going to ask agencies to conduct an assessment of what you're currently doing to protect your information. And from a physical standpoint, agencies are found to be you know, affording a certain level of protection to this information already. 
So when you look at our 32 CFR, and I encourage everybody to do it, man, I hear you get to talk with my hands too much. I, I encourage everybody to take a look at it, and you're going to find that there are some soft spots in that regulation, and there are some hard lines, meaning that when you get to the area of IT security, because this is where most of our information resides in the electronic environment, you're going to find a hard line for how to protect this information. And for the IT folks in the room, it's the moderate confidentiality impact value. But let's take a, a step back to physical safeguarding. Physical safeguarding, you could almost view it as kind of a, a soft spot in the program, meaning that we aren't pointing to a particular standard. All we say is that CUI in the physical world needs to be protected in a controlled environment. And what that really means is that agencies need to define that for themselves, because you have already, you have physical security programs, and you need to evaluate to ensure that those protective measures are actually in place. And a controlled environment just means that a guy off the street or a stranger to your agency or your organization just can't walk into your spaces, open up drawers and start looking around or even access computer systems. You have procedural or administrative controls in place to prevent unauthorized access. That's part of the physical safeguarding. So for the most part, this is low-hanging fruit within agencies because every agency has some kind of protective measures when it comes to the physical environment already in place. Just validate that they're in place and make corrections as needed. Now, from a system standpoint, again, this is one of the hard lines of the CUI program. And notice that from day zero, or when this regulation becomes effective, we're asking agencies to conduct an assessment. We want you to assess how many systems you have, whether or not those systems contain CUI, as described on our CUI registry, and, of course, how they're configured. Because, again, we have a line in the sand on how that system should be configured going forward. Now, that's due within six months, that assessment. Now, it's usually a quick phone call to your chief information officer to get that answer, but there may be a little bit more work depending on the complexities of your agency. Now, in the next six months or one year from the re regulation, we expect agencies to have a plan in place, a transition plan. So all the systems that fell short of that standard of protection in the IT world need to be targeted for configuration. We're not saying do it in a year. We're saying that you need to target those systems that fell short of that standard to plan to modify them to that. Now, again, I can't stress enough that the CUI program is based off of existing agency practices. So a lot of your computer systems are already configured to that standard, and you're already protecting that information in the physical world to a particular standard. Now's the time to go out and validate and identify the small gaps. Now, of course, the last element of implementation is a self-inspection program, meaning that you know, you're looking at the oversight arm for the Information Security Oversight Office. It's me. I can't go to every agency and every major component within the executive branch. I can require you to report to me so that way I can consolidate that data and report to the president, but every agency needs to develop an inspection mechanism for your own agencies. You know, you think about the Department of Defense, they're huge. I can't visit every major component there, but the Department of Defense can, and they can consolidate those findings and report them up. So every agency needs to have a self-inspection program in place to evaluate your policies, ensure that those safeguarding requirements are articulated in your training programs, and of course, taking steps, take steps to mitigate any incidents that have occurred. Some additional things to consider within agencies when it comes to implementation, of course, are you need somebody to lead the charge within your agencies. And again, I said that agencies already have a senior agency official and a program manager designated, but every major component within those agencies also needs some kind of official designated to lead the charge for CUI implementation. From an incident management standpoint, anytime you have an information security program where you tell the workforce to protect information in a particular way, you are going to have folks who do, don't do it that way. They're just going to do whatever they want, and that would be an incident in the CUI program. So what you need from an implementation standpoint is you need a way for the employees to report mishandlings or incidents regarding this information type, and your incident system needs to um, be sophisticated enough to apply measures to prevent recurrence. If an incident happens, your system shouldn't just be a recording system. It needs to take action based off of that. Analyzing incident trends, beefing up policy and procedures, or even training programs to emphasize where the trends show that you're weak. Now, contracts and agreements, of course, every agency doesn't do it alone. You always enter into agreements with other agencies to fulfill certain mission and functions for you, and also you contract out. Part of the CUI program will be to identify all the agreements that you have in place to see what type of guidance you're giving to these entities. You know, are you prescribing 
safeguarding measures through your agreements because there's one key element of the CUI program you need to keep in mind is that there will be strict limits placed on the applicability of agency policies, meaning that you can't say you have to do it our way to an external. They have to do it in accordance with the 32 CFR 2002. Agency policies can only get you so far in the CUI program. They govern your own agency, but you can't push those out the door onto others or onto other agencies as well. So now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the CUI program. And the back half of this will go a lot faster, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, somebody tackle me if I'm running over time. All right. So real quick, this is what we're going to cover in the back half. Of course, the difference between basic and specified, emphasis on the limitations and the applicability of agency policies, a little bit on controlled environments, marking. There is a hard marking requirement in the CUI program. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Then we're going to take you to destruction. Of course, this is going to take you through the life cycle of the information. So really quick, I think I covered this, but this is a very important point. There are two types of CUI. There's the basic kind, which are based off of those vague laws and regulations that say, please protect this. And then there's those that are prescriptive in nature. And keep in mind that when laws and regulations are prescriptive in nature, they're not completely prescriptive, meaning that they are silent in certain aspects, like protection in the electronic environment. And that's where the CUI program fills in. You need to do an inventory of the types of information you're handling and also identify whether or not they're basic or specified. Because when it comes to CUI markings, that's going to matter. So just keep that in mind. That's kind of looming out there. So um, limitations on the applicability of agency policy. Again, this is a, what I would consider to be an inspectable item on an agency's self-inspection program. And it's also on my part when I go out and assess an agency. I want to see if your contracts and agreements are actually pushing policy out the door, or if you are adhering to the concept of the CUI program, which is, hey, we can't tell them exactly how to do it. We can point them to the CUI program, and that's how protection will take place. So keep an eye on for that, because that will be uh, an inspectable item. Now, generally, from a safeguarding standpoint, of course, CUI must be protected, and agencies, for the most part, can define what that protection is. Now, you can define it in a number of ways. Some agencies use your PIV card or your CAT card to establish a, a controlled environment, meaning that if your card's not coded to a particular room, you don't get access. Some agencies are still using lock and keys, and some are using angry administrative assistance to control access to a room. <laughs> Whatever you define it as, that works for me, you know, but you need to define it within your agencies. Now, system standpoint, now, um, this is where we did poll agencies on what the current protective measures were for CUI in the electronic environment. Basically, what are you doing right now? The overwhelming response from agencies is, was that they're protecting their systems at the moderate confidentiality impact value. Now, for the folks in the room who are not IT specialists, what that really means is that if you looked at FIPS 199 and NIST SP 853, which are guidance documents that basically give you a roadmap on how to configure a system, that moderate confidentiality impact value equates to a number of security controls that can be applied to a system to protect it. So you need to work with your IT folks. So, so hopefully I'm getting the message out there that the CUI program and its implementation will involve various folks within your agencies. You're going to need to bring in your chief information officer, your physical security guys, also your records guys, um, also all the way down to um, your incident responders. So marking CUI, this is an example of what mar a marked CUI document will look like. Of course, um, this is a pretty extreme case of a CUI marking. Of course, you have a banner at the top, which indicates that, hey, this is CUI. It shows portion markings, and it shows a banner at the bottom. Now, the only real requirement when it comes to CUI marking is the top banner, meaning that portion marking is an optional best practice. Also, applying a footer to that document is also an optional best practice. So it really breaks down into three elements. You have a control marking. That's what we call it in the CUI program. This is the declaration to your intended recipient that, hey, what you're going to be receiving is CUI and it needs to be protected. Now, this can be accomplished by the word controlled or the acronym CUI at the top center of the page. That's the control marking. Now, remember, if that document contains CUI specified, meaning that there's a prescriptive law or regulation associated with that information type, you must also call out that category of information on the page. And you precede the category marking with the letters SP dash. The SP is the declaration. This is a specified category, and then whatever the acronym happens to be. 
The 23 categories of information found on our CUI registry all have category or category markings associated with them. Now the last element of our banner marking, which is the basic requirement for CUI, is something called the dissemination control marking. Now what is, what is that exactly? This is, you can imagine that if some agencies right now, they, ha they control information. It's for official use only information, and they want to restrict that information to only, let's say, U.S. citizens. No foreign national should have access to this particular information type. The CUI program allows, the, allows for this and also gives you some real estate on the page to apply those markings. So um, you can go to our CUI registry. It's kind of your one-stop shop for what the category markings are going to be and also what dissemination controls can be applied to CUI. But um, all these different elements of the banner are separated by two forward slashes. For those of you familiar with the classified program, that'll be familiar to you. Um, but keep in mind that the portion marking and footer markings are not required. Now, we recognize, am I, oh, she wasn't signaling me. Okay, so really quick, we recognized in the CUI program that a lot of our information resides in the electronic environment, and it is not possible or it would be overly burdensome to remark all these information types, you know, all the PDFs and files that we have on our systems. So what we've done here is we've recreated like a release valve for agencies, meaning that there's an administrative way to still meet the intent of marking within the CUI program. Basically, that if your senior agency official has worked with your agency head and determined that individual markings of these information types are overly burdensome, they can waive them to some degree, but the requirement to alert the intended recipient of the fact that CUI is there is still, it's kind of looming. So what you can do, you can imagine that every time we access a computer system, usually there's a little pop-up screen that says, ooh, you're accessing a government system. This contains FOUO. That banner marking now, or that pop-up, can now say, government system, this contains CUI. That's your alert. You know, most people click right through that, but you're actually meeting the intent of the regulation. So keep in mind that um, there's going to be a lot of changes to identify things when you ship them out. Of course, I have a box on the screen here, so let's imagine that you want to send a box of CUI, or you're um, an attorney, and you're sending CUI to um, the Department of Justice for them to do something fancy with it. Now, it may not be possible or may be overly burdensome to mark every individual piece that you're sending to the Department of Justice, but it's possible for you to identify it on some kind of a transmittal document or even on the um, paperwork associated with that. Or if you're storing it within your agency, you may not need to mark every individual piece of CUI in the, a particular file room, but you can indicate it on the outside of the door for some reason, or you can control access. It just depends. There's a lot of different ways that you can address the marking requirement in the CUI program. This, of course, is a snapshot of uh, the CUI registry. Of course, you have a basic description for every category or subcategory of CUI and the underlying authority that relates. The authorities will be identified as either being basic or specified. So just keep that in mind so you will know whether or not to apply um, a specified marking to that information. Of course, this is an example of a marked document that's specified, you know, controlled, forward slashes, SP, whatever the category marking has to be. Now, marking in the CY program is a little complicated, of course. Um, it's going to be a culture shift to a lot of agencies who are not used to marking information in the unclassified environment. So ISOO has developed a marking handbook that's available from our website now. If you were to look at it, you could um, download it, print it, do whatever you want to do with it. Um, but it's a great training resource for your workforce out there. Now, also, cover sheets. Again, earlier I joked that we, we held some serious debate among agencies on what the color of our cover sheets should be, and that's uh, the actual truth. Some folks wanted pink, brown, you name it. But we ended up settling on green, and we settled on three different types of our cover sheets. Because right now, you can imagine that there's 120 or so different information types in the government, and there's a cover sheet to it that goes along with each one of those information types. So we needed to do a little bit of house cleaning. Think about the CUI program as we're cleaning house. We're limiting what we're protecting, and we're standardizing how we're identifying that information. So these three cover sheets are available from GSA or also ISU's website for download. Um, they give you a lot of real estate on the page to apply whether or not certain categories of information are contained in them and also other places. Uh, but 
Legacy information, so this is the, the big elephant in the room. Of course, right now, the government has been marking things as FOU, OSSI, you name it, SBU for years. So we have large volumes of this information out there. And the overwhelming question is, do I have to remark all of that? And what happens when I do remark it? First, the agency heads need to make a management decision about remarking legacy information. The policy is pretty clear on it. It says that legacy information needs to be remarked. However, that's overly burdensome for an agency. So really, the marking requirement for the CUI program takes hold when you're transmitting it to a, to a recipient who has never seen it before, or if you're reusing it in a, new, in a new document. A couple of things when you're reusing legacy information that qualifies to be CUI, because all FOUO is not automatically CUI. There needs to be an analysis. You need to look at it and say, does this fall into one of these categories of information found on the CUI registry? If it does, of course, mark it as CUI. If it doesn't, you know, don't carry forward those marking. Now, this is an important point is that as agencies implement the CUI program, there should never be a situation where you have a CUI marked document that's also marked as being for official use only or even portion marked to indicate an FOUO portion. FOUO and all those legacy markings die on derivative use. So keep that in mind. So, all right, this is my last slide, and I think I'm, I'm right in time. So taking you through the life cycle of CUI, of course, what it is, how to mark it, how to share it, and also how to destroy it. So when we asked agencies how do they currently destroy CUI, regardless of media, the, uh, the overwhelming response was a document developed by NIST. It's the NIST SP-888, Guidelines for Media Sanitization. This could be familiar to you because it's the standard that you're using right now probably to degauss or sanitize hard drives or, you know, iPhones. This is a pretty uh, robust document. Now, I have a, an example on the page here, shred. There's office spaces throughout the entire government. Each one of these offices probably have a shredder in them. So from an implementation standpoint, we're going to ask agencies to evaluate how are you destroying CUI at your agencies? What is the standard that you're using? What are the shred particle size for those, um, the shredders that you currently have in use? Hopefully the answer is, oh, we got 888, NIST SP 888 across the board, but that's probably not the answer because the standard has been out there for a long time. Your IT guys are sanitizing hard drives to this standard, but the administrative folks throughout your entire agencies are not buying shredders that align to this particular standard. Now, what I have on the page here, of course, is some shred particles. Now, what does that actually come from? It comes from a shredder that was purchased, you know, unfortunately by my office, and it was asserted by the company that it was CUI approved. It was not. <laughs> so if you take a look, I don't know if it comes out, but I actually have Batman, social security number, his address. This is a cross-cut shredder that produces particles one millimeter by 40 millimeter, not approved for CUI. Buyer beware. If you're going to go out and buy new shredders for your agencies, you want to look for a shredder that produces particles that are one millimeter by five. You shouldn't be able to distinguish a letter or a number off of that page. That's all I have. I'll open it up for some questions. Of course, if we can't get to your questions in the room, my email is on the slide. Uh, please shoot me an email. I go out to agencies and I offer briefings to help you get your arms around what it takes to implement the CUI program. So we'll open it for questions, or unless you want to kick me off the stage. I'm good either way. Hi, I wanted to find out, um, is there going to be CUI training now, um, a part of the NARA, offered as a NARA training course? I know right now it's a lot of record stuff, but this yeah. would be great. So, it, yes. <laughs> so, the, of course, we are going to offer some training for agencies and industry folks who are going to be working with the CUI program. It's not going to be off of the learning management system that was described earlier. It, if you go right to our ISU's website or the CUI registry, there's a, a separate module there that speaks to training. Now, right now, you'll get a general overview of the executive order there, the difference between the CUI program and the Freedom of Information Act. But within the next 180 days, ISU has taken it on to develop a series of training modules that will help agencies um, in their training efforts. You know, things that speak to the, of course, the CUI registry, 
our dissemination standard, which is lawful government purpose, and a couple of other things. But um, it's going to be an, a continuous effort by ISOO to constantly develop training tools and uh, training modules to help agencies along the way. It's 11.48. I know, I'm just <laughs> Okay, I, I apologize, I, I ran a little over my time, but um, please uh, shoot me an email. I'm happy to um, talk with you or answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Don Rosen, the Director of Records Management Reporting and Oversight, uh, and I know we're kind of running towards the end, but I want to take a few minutes. Um, as I mentioned back in September, uh, reporting uh, window is opening very soon, so I just wanted to reemphasize some of the deadlines and what we're going to be doing for reporting this year. Um, so the big one, of course, is, is uh, hopefully everyone knows by now, is our reporting period for this year for Records Management Reporting is going to be January 9th through March 17th. Um, and this is doing this for a variety of reasons. Big one is to get us past the uh, December 31st, 2016 email goal deadline. Uh, it's hard to believe. I just calculated it's 18 days from now. So uh, for those who have been following this for a while, it's uh, since 2012 that it's finally here. So to get us back past that date, and also we know that people are busy with uh, transition activities, et cetera. Um, so what's going to be required? Uh, three things this year, um, the senior agency official report, uh, a federal email management report, uh, just to get us a deeper dive into what everyone is doing around their email, and of course, our annual records management self-assessment. Um, and of course, we'll be sending out the RMSA and the email questionnaires ahead of that uh, reporting deadline kicking off as we've done in the past. We'll send you uh, a PDF and a Word version, um, and we'll probably have that out pretty soon. We're going to have an AC uh, communications. We're getting ready to wrap up and send out, so you'll have that uh, in, in short order, hopefully with probably potentially this week or early next. Um, again, I'm going to go quickly because I know we're running low on time. Uh, for the RMSA, it's going to be very similar to uh, years past. Uh, nothing should be any surprise to those who have taken it. For the, we're asking all records officers to be taking this again. Um, the questions will be similar, as we always like to be consistent. We do have some new topics we're throwing in uh, around oversight, disposition, electronic records, um, a little more on the directive. Uh, we'll again be using our Qualtrics tool, uh, and this uh, links will be sent out to the records officers and the designated uh, RMSA respondents. So uh, nothing new in the RMSA, but our, our team will be sending those questionnaires out um, soon. Uh, for the SEO reports, this will be going to email to your SAO. Uh, again, it will look and feel similar to past ones we've done, um, but the questions are somewhat different. Uh, we're still going to ask about the directive goals. We want to know progress you're making uh, toward, on 1.1, which is the 2019 goal. But we are going to ask the yes, no question, did you meet the 2016 goal? That's very important to us. We want to know that. Uh, then we'll ask additional questions. I believe that question around digitization strategies for permanent records. Again, trying to learn more about how you're working towards 2019. Uh, we have a question about A130 and a couple other questions. Uh, but again, the look and feel will be very similar to years past. Uh, it'll be an award template. And then again, that'll be sent to the SAOs. Uh, and I believe we'll CC the records officers on those as well. Okay, so that's what we're doing for the SAOs. Um, I should also point out that we will be posting the SAO reports and our email reports up online. This is what we did last year, uh, so which worked really well. So as we get them in, we'll be posting the SAO reports up online. Uh, we also, of course, will be posting the records management uh, complete self-assessment when that's completed. Um, the one area I wanted that is new that we've talked about a little bit, just want to take a little deeper dive into the email management report. Uh, as we mentioned, we needed to, we wanted to kind of pull this out separately so we can exp uh, get a better sense of how you're meeting the 2016 email goal, uh, especially following our success criteria. So we've developed a maturity model-like approach to get that information. Uh, it'll look very similar to um, the RMSA, and since we're using the same tool, you'll get a link in Qualtrics. So you'll be getting two links this year, one link for the RMSA and a second link for this uh, email management report. Um, and we did that primarily so we can break out the email information and then we can also post that up online. So for the records officer, you're going to be doing those two things. Um, just some of the general instructions. The 
report uh, will basically have four areas it's going to touch on that map to the success criteria. We're going to ask you a question about do you have email policies in place, do you have email systems in place, or a question about access, and a question about disposition. So you'll read each of these scenarios and then you'll rate where you think you fall um, from like a zero to like five score. You'll pick where you think you are, which area best match what you're doing, and, and then you'll get a score. So to give you a sense of what it looks like, uh, this somewhat's what it looked like in Qualtrics. Uh, for this one, for example, it's for about policies. We'll ask you, you know, do you have policies in place? And you'll kind of pick where you think you fall. Like you might check you have absolutely no policies in place versus uh, kind of moving down the compendium. Uh, you might have policies in draft state versus at the, the final one there where you actually have everything in place. So we'll get a sense of where you are in each of these categories. And this is really to give us a sense of where uh, you are, um, and then it'll help us to see where gaps are too, where we might need to issue new policy, different things like that. So um, just sort of take a gauge of where you, your best guess of where you think you fall in any of these different success criteria categories. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll apply a score to it. Um, so there are four scored questions, so it'll be a total of 16 points. Um, so we're scared of a score of zero to four, very much like a traditional maturity model for that. And then we'll divide that score. So overall for the four categories, you might average like a three or a 2.5, depending on it. So then you'll get a sense of where you think you are with managing your email. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll apply it, similar to what we've done with the RMSA with the high, low, um, and moderate risk categories of how, in this case, we'll just apply to how you're managing your email. So if you ended up with a 2.9, for example, for when you added all the categories together, you might be in moderate risk of managing your email versus if you uh, selected, you rated threes and fours and everything, you'd be in the low risk category. So that's our approach. Again, it's really to give us a sense of where you are uh, in managing your email in the different categories. Um, so hopefully it's a useful tool for you as well. Uh, we encourage you to work with your IT folks, your general counsel and others as you take this and answer the questions. Um, important notice that my team has stressed that I make sure I, I get across and I will do that, hence the word important. Uh, two separate links, one for the RMSA and one for federal email management you'll be receiving. Um, we're doing that so we can post it, uh, the email management report to the website and because we're scoring them independently. The RMSA is going to be scored exactly how it has been for the last few years. Nothing's going to change there. So that'll be, uh, those of you who've taken it before, nothing is changing other than a few questions. Then, of course, this email management uh, report as well. So those are two things there. Uh, another thing I want to make sure is please let us know if there's any contact information changing before January 9th. Let us know today if you can um, or very soon. Uh, for the email and the RMSA, that's the email address we'd like you to send it to, rmselfassessment at nara.gov, and our staff can make sure that we have the right email to send the links to. It's very important for us. And for the SAO um, report, send any changes to prmd at nara.gov. Um, so those are the key takeaways I have for you. Um, I know I kind of moved through that kind of quickly, but I know we're running out of time. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is we do plan to take, uh, to do a webinar on reporting sometime possibly in uh, late, late January after we've kicked off the reporting window, if anyone has any questions, we can walk through it about any of the different templates that we're doing this year. We'll schedule something, we'll send out a notice so if we can actually spend like an hour actually going through all the various uh, reporting things we're doing. We're happy to do that. And of course, at any time during the reporting period, feel free to contact myself. Uh, there's my contact information, uh, Cindy Smolovic, who is leading our reporting efforts and collection this year. She's actually uh, standing by, ready to answer any questions. Our team does a great job uh, dealing with all the different questions that come in as you take either the RMSA or the SEO report, we're, we're standing by ready to help. Um, and we look forward to a, uh, a great reporting period, kicking that off right after the holidays. Um, and if there's any quick questions before we adjourn today, I'd be happy uh, to take them. No questions on reporting? Everyone's ready? All right. Ah, question. Please. <laughs> Um, my question is about the reporting and the email, yes. the email reporting in this new wonderful CUI requirement that started on, I guess, 14 November. A lot of us have already made policies, 
not including that. So as we get this questionnaire, how, how, would we base that off of, off of the requirement that we were given for this, or are we supposed to be including statements regarding how we implemented this new requirement that was implemented on 14 November? Um, for our email, it's really about the, the success criteria is how we're doing that in those four categories. It's not, it's separate from whatever the CUI requirements are. We're not. So we if our policies, as long as we're covering what you outline in the policies, yeah, the success if, it, criteria. if this That's misses, we're looking then... to information on is our success criteria. Okay. And use that as your guide. Other questions? Questions? Anyone else? Any questions on the online? Okay, uh, I'm going to also uh, close out the meeting uh, with just a reminder uh, that Team One uh, is available. They are meeting in the Washington room at 1 o'clock, so we encourage you to come back and meet with those folks. Uh, in addition, our next bridge meeting will be Tuesday, February 14th, 2017, Valentine's Day. So we will see you all in February. I wish everyone healthy and happy uh, holiday season and happy new year and we'll see you all uh, in February. So have a great afternoon, everybody.